We've talked about our favorite moments, but I do want to talk about the moments that didn't work for us. Mm -hmm. And one of them for me, as much as I appreciated it, was how quickly Ray knew how to do everything that, as you said, it took yeah. Luke three movies yeah. to do. It just, she didn't have training, she didn't have Yoda, you know, that we know of speaking in her ear saying yeah, this is yeah. how you do it. She just knew she could do a Jedi mind trick and, you know, she Do you would, know how high her midichlorian count is? <laughs> you know, I cannot wait until we find out. I'm gonna, one of the toys, one it was of the, gonna break <laughs> that little meter no, that Qui-Gon had. I do, I do hope that when we find out more about yeah. Rey and her origin, which I think is inevitable, you know, whether she is Luke's child, which I, I hope, I hope isn't not. the case. Yeah. I think it's very easy to do it yeah. that way. Yeah. I honestly hope that her parentage isn't that important. Um, but I think when we do find out more about her, I want it to be explained why that came so easily to her, whether it's this theory that Rebel Base is probably going to yeah. get into more, or whether it's just that she is so incredibly powerful with the Force yeah. that it does come naturally. Yeah, because, you know, him the, the, the so that moment that we keep talking about, because it's a great moment of her pulling that lightsaber out of the snow, another visual callback to Empire Strikes Back. But yeah, like, we got the idea in Empire and nothing so far in any of the canon is... Uh, contradicted this, that that was the first time Luke did that. Yeah. And that was three years since the events of uh, New Hope. So it's like, yeah, the fact that, yeah, she was able to do that. It, it It's both, on one hand, it's like, oh, it's just, just a funny thing because that's what they want to do in the moment, or will they actually address that and just, you know, yeah, how powerful I'm she is. I'm willing yeah. to give it the benefit of the doubt yeah. and say, okay, this will be explained later. But I think, and I think for the sake of the movie, it's really cool to have Ray's yeah. art go so quickly. But I think what's interesting is J.J. Abrams is a very, um, he's a very, like, frenetic, like, very quick filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He doesn't waste a lot of screen time. And I think if you go back to just the style of filmmaking in the 70s, it did take its time a lot more with these scenes. And so I think, you know, upon repeat viewings, because we've all only seen it once so far, we're going to glean a lot <laughs> more change quickly. from the movie. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I do think the first time I saw it, you know, some of the beats maybe I missed or I felt were really skimmed over just for the sake of keeping the story going at this quick pace. This is kind of an aside, but I, I they're going to have a real hard time keeping certain things secret and not showing footage if Luke is a heavy part of the new movie. I mean, we know he's going to be, but you, like... Yeah. Episode 8. Yeah, you're going to start... Yeah, episode 8. You're going to start thinking like you're going to be able to piece those things together if they show too much footage of him in the next in the trailers for that. Yeah. Which is weird because it's like you're gonna then keep him out of marketing materials or they'll, they'll just have to be general. I think it. they'll embrace him being a part of the marketing, but of course they can still be selective on Yeah. yeah. yeah well yeah. I thought what was interesting um is that J.J. Abrams said that the thing that got him hooked to the idea of doing episode six is the question of who is Luke Skywalker. Right. And because of that I expected us to at least get something yeah, of that in yeah. this movie. And by the end we still don't know who he is, and like that's that's okay. But in terms of this being its own movie, which is what I thought was the goal, I thought having such a big cliffhanger ending where Luke is uh, is basically the the item that the MacGuffin that we're after this entire story, um, not have any sort of real resolution was a little bit of a strange note. It, but though it did leave me really excited to see, okay, now that you've done all the nostalgia stuff, now that you've established everything. Mm -hmm. Where are we going that's different? What are we doing that's different? Let's have a weird episode eight. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's similar to, um, I guess, what J.J. did with Star Trek in that mm -hmm. he's like, I have all this stuff that I have to deal with. And yeah. I, I have to get through this thing and take it to a good place so I can tell more stories. Now, I don't think, you know, there's any, we don't even need to draw connections between episode eight and Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah. I don't think it's going to follow that path. But, and uh, it's Ryan Johnson directing it. Yeah, <laughs> it, is, it is. And you know, like they've been working together on story for a long time. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously, it's going to work in that world. You know, it's going to con continue on. To me, a cliffhanger did not bother me at all. I knew I was going to get a cliffhanger. I thought it was going to be, mm -hmm. you know, something pretty major. But um, yeah. But it's interesting because that ending, I should say, that ending, uh, because I do think the movie, to a fault, is emulating the uh, the others, especially New Hope. But the, the end doesn't, you know, it's not like Phantom Menace, which also had a, a big celebration with everyone standing on stage. Yeah. It goes in a very different direction and is the first of the uh, the three trilogies now to have the first movie end on a cliffhanger. Yeah, Phantom Menace has the, like, who was the master, who was the apprentice, but not as big as, like, this. Like, this yeah. is, like, a mid-scene, like, 
yeah. you know, cutting off. But that does make me even more excited about, yeah, what's next? Because I don't think they're going to be as nostalgia-driven. You know, this movie was so important as far as relaunching the brand and relaunching Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to go in a... I don't expect the next movie, uh, except that it probably will be the second one's darker, but I don't think it'll feel like Empire Strikes Back as far as hitting the beats as hard. Well, Thanks. we get to see Luke as a Jedi Master, right? Like, yeah. that's, yeah. that, that's going to be... The story, the, yeah. essentially, of episode Why eight. Why is he at the, the Jedi story. Temple? It's going to be the, the treat of episode eight, you yeah. know, and the Jedi Temple and all that stuff is just, you know, like, we're going to get a lot of lore that we haven't gotten before mm -hmm. and we've gotten in the EU, but not, like, now this is canon, so yeah. we're going to get all kinds of new stuff. Let's um, talk about Snoke, though. We'll, oh, yeah, we'll get into the questions we have about him, but did, mm -hmm. did he work for you? Um, he was a little weird to me because he was sort of nebulous and... At a glance, it was like, oh, he's pretty Palpatine, you know, hologram guy, yeah. bald, kind of disfigured. Palpatine meets Gollum. Yeah. Um, yeah meets something from the Hobbit. Yeah, yeah, so in this movie, he made no impression on me, uh, very sort of ethereal, but certainly, again, raises huge questions. Who is he? Where is he from? Where does is he, he have this? this big? Yeah, is he tiny? <laughs> is he giant? Or is he a normal-sized dude? Um, and yeah, where does his knowledge base come from? You know, he can't just be some random guy, right? He's got to have some connection to something that even gives him this knowledge. Uh, so yeah, the character, I wasn't like, ooh, cool. I just wanted, I was like, okay, well, what's, what's his deal? Well, you the know? tease for him was uh, a bit like much for me. Like the marketing tease was like, oh, the physicality of him could not be reflected by not doing mocap. And it's like, you could have very yeah, easily could have been. Yeah, yeah. makeup, I think. Well, what we saw in this movie could yeah. have been done right. with a guy, you know. But we'll he just he looked like, yeah, he looked like a mashup of, like, uh, Voldemort and, you know, Gollum or something like mm -hmm. that to me. With a huge, like, I don't know, gash in his head, whatever that is. Yeah, I thought he felt a little, like, stereotypical, like, Marvel villainy, yeah. like, sci-fi villainy, like what we've seen. Um, I can't even think of an immediate example, but like he, he felt sort of stereotypical in what we have come to establish as like yeah. evil creatures. Uh, but I again, like I want to give this the benefit of the doubt yeah. and say we could get something really cool. Yeah. Before we move on from from, we know one issues. thing: he's a total total egomaniac. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> it's like not only am I going to have an entire <laughs> temple, you know, that is dedicated to my holographic image, it's going to be like the friggin' Lincoln Memorial. Snoke loves was, Snoke, man. I thought it was interesting Maz had like a statue of herself over oh, yeah. her like I know. pirate base too, but I was okay I honestly with it. thought that was a story thing. I think they were like, don't forget this is Maz's place. Right, right. right. This is a big deal. Yeah, they but had some interesting visual it, cues. That was kind of weird. I was like, yeah, I don't I don't know that this woman would erect a statue to herself. <laughs> You had a bit of a chewy issue in one particular scene, though, I know you wanted to bring up. Oh, yeah, it was funny because Scott Clora brought it up to uh, just a weird, weird beat, uh, which is simply when Chewie, uh, when they return after the spoiler alert, after Han's death, they just do a very strange, it's a staging thing. It's a, uh, because he literally walks by Leia. So it's like the two characters who should be the most, and they are separately, the most wrecked by Han's death don't even look at each other. They don't hug each other. There's just this weird non-beat between them. And it felt kind of weird because it's like they wanted the Leia and Rey thing to happen. Which is also Which weird. is also weird, but it was at the expense of Chewbacca who's literally in the scene and walks by. So it just felt very strange. I was like, maybe Wookiees grieve differently, <laughs> you know? And, and she knows that. And she's like, I need we'll to give him his, Yeah, it. I need to give him his death. Because they, they had a great moment earlier when they hugged, when oh, you know, yeah. Han and her were so uneasy, and then Chewbacca goes up and hugs her. Uh, so that was just really strange. It was like, Chewie, Leia, deal with this. You it's know? funny because we've all only seen this once at this point. So, right. you know, like it's, it's really tough sometimes to talk about a movie in this much depth when yeah. you've seen it one time. Um, but... You know, it's funny what people pick up on. I didn't even, I like, with the excitement of this movie, there are details that people are like, can you believe it when this happened? And I was like, I don't know that I saw <laughs> I don't know that I even remember them hugging, you know? Right. That's kind of how it is, you know? Like, you're sort of racing to put it all together yeah. in your mind.